So the mechanism by which they believe that adverse childhood experiences affects well-being over the lifespan is, is demonstrated by this little pyramid. So when kids have these adversities, it disrupts their neurodevelopment, so, and that presents itself as social, emotional, and cognitive impairments, so they have problems in school, they have problems with language, they have problems with peers, they don't do so well in school. They're, you know, they're one of the coping strategies they uh, tend to develop, or the coping strategies they tend to develop are, are sort of higher risk behaviors like smoking, um, promiscuity, that kind of thing, and that uh, leads them to greater likelihood of disease, disability, social problems, and ultimately death. So, I mean, so this, I know it's kind of, this is a really big downer, isn't it? But, but um, the, the, the great thing about our, uh, this recognition is that we see now, it's, it's well established that early life has uh, huge impacts on people over the lifespan. And now we also know why. Because not only, so this was just correlational, right? We saw the more adversities that people had in childhood that they reported, the more problems they had as adults. But now we also know why. And one of the reasons is, um, as it goes back to that fight or flight response. So when people are chronically stressed, in the absence of support from loved ones, they have uh, elevated stress hormones. So this is just a study, I could have picked a whole, you know, there's one of a dozen uh, articles I could have used to highlight this point. But poor children, experience elevated stress. So when they look at poor children's cortisol, which is a stress hormone, epinephrine and norepinephrine, other um, uh, hormones in the fight or flight response, you see that children who have middle income have lower cortisol than children who are in poverty, have uh, children who are in poverty have higher epinephrine than children middle income, and children, and, and the same goes with norepinephrine. So and I just, I sort of started to allude to the fact that that kind of wears down. The body, it wears the body down when the, you're constantly in that fight or flight um, physiologic state. And the other thing that's explaining so much of, of how early experiences affects development over the lifespan is coming from the field of epigenetics. And I don't, I've, could you just raise your hand if you've heard of the term before? Okay, good. And it's, it's fairly new. Um, we really, until about... I don't know, five or six years ago, I was of the belief, like a lot of people, that we have our genes and our genes are expressed and, and they, nothing affects that. Our genes are expressed. We have a gene for eye color. We have a gene for height. We have a gene for, you know, how our temperament, say, it's probably a collection of genes, but nonetheless, genes for everything that determines who we are. But what they've come to discover in the last, well, it's been about 10 years, but only about five years is really getting out in the public, and so I write about this in my book, is that experience, particularly early caregiving experience, and actually some prenatal experiences too, prenatal stress is another one. So prenatal stress and early caregiving in particular turns genes on or off. So if you're a child who has a, a gene that makes you more likely to have a mental health problem as an adult, there are genes for that. But if you're reared by a mother or father or both or multiple, you know, lots of multi-generations of people that really nurture and support and have good serve and return with that baby, the likelihood of that gene being expressed is much lower. In contrast, a child with that same gene that makes them likely to have a, a mental health problem reared under conditions where parents are not a nurturant because they're suffering from a toxic stressor, that they're unable to do those serve and return relationships, it um, leaves the gene turned on, and it makes the child more likely to have a mental health problem. So, and these genes are actually functioning within the brain, and, and most of the data are coming from animal models, but the early data we have from humans suggests that we are, that's what's happening. Early life experiences are turning genes on or off that affect our later health and development. Okay. And the only thing I want, I keep wanting to point this out, but the stress is only toxic in the absence of support. So, you, you know, I say to parents when you're a new parent, get all your, you know, gather your wagons around and get all the support you can. That's when you should be asking your mother and friends and family to give you a hand. When they're, when your child's a little older and you can return the favor, you will, right? So it's, that's the time, or now is the time for those who are, you know, in that stage, be asking for the help, get the help that you need because it's, it, it, you, you should. And the other thing I just want to point out again is that parent-child relationship quality, those serve and return relationships are protective. They reduce children's stress. So, you know, your mother can be depressed, and I'm going to show you some data on that, but a mother can be depressed, and yet she's able to be nurturant, serve and return with her child. That's going to protect the child's development. As well, there's some suggestion that if a mother's depressed and yet she's got someone else coming in there as a support, like the dad. The dad's a big 
a really important person in the child's life at any time. But when mom's depressed and a little bit unable to manage the, the situation, dad, dad can step in and provide that serve and return, that nurturance that the child needs until the mom is better. So my comment here really is that if you're facing adversity, I mean, just it's good to recognize it and get help. I mean, there's help available. So, and they all fit together. I always say to parents, you can't give what you don't have. So if you, if you don't feel like you have the emotional energy to manage your own, you know, you're depressed or you, you, you're relying on, um, or there's a lot of stress in your life and you can't cope very well, how are you going to help? A, how are you going to give you emotional energy to your child. So, but social support for parenting, we know, relates to healthier child development. So basically the point here is if you're facing adversity, you can help if you know someone. You know, this is another really important thing I, I like to say, because we know one in seven moms have postpartum depression. One in 10 dads have postpartum depression. And my own research tells me they don't want to come forward for a whole variety of reasons. But if you ask them, they really appreciate it. And I think that if you do think you have a friend or you know, you see someone in a mom's group that you might think is struggling, ask them about it and, and, and encourage them to get support from their doctor, from their family, somebody, you know, that goes a long way. In other presentations I've done, I have quotes from mothers who've had depression, and there's a quote that stands out in my mind where um, a mother said to us, you know, if someone asks me how I'm feeling, I say I'm fine and I smile, but deep down inside I'm screaming, for God's sakes, help me. You know, so there's this real need, and I, and I, I just, I just want to put that out there to, to you know, offer support and, and go seek support, please, if, if you're um, facing adversity. All right, so what does serve and return look like? We talked a little bit about tennis ball. It probably doesn't resonate at all, for, you know, really. What does that mean? So we're going to talk about what that, what that looks like a bit more. But to get us into the feeling, I'm going to um, show a little video from the Harvard Center in the Developing Child where they, they're the ones that developed the terminology serve and return. And I'm just going to get that up now. The key to forming strong brain architecture is what's known as serve and return interaction with adults. In this developmental game, new neural connections form in the brain as young children instinctively serve through babbling, facial expressions, and gestures. And adults return the serve, responding in a very directed, meaningful way. It starts very early in life, when a baby coos and the adult interacts and directs the baby's attention to a face or hand. This interaction forms the foundation of brain architecture upon which all future development will be built. It helps create neural connections between all the different areas of the brain, building the emotional and cognitive skills children need in life. For example, here's how it works for literacy and language skills. When the baby sees an object, the adult says its name. This makes connections in the baby's brain between particular sounds and their corresponding objects. Later, adults show young children that those objects and sounds can also be represented by marks on a page. With continued support from adults, children then learn how to decipher writing and eventually to write themselves. Each stage builds on what came before. Ensuring that children have adult caregivers who consistently engage and serve in return interaction, beginning in infancy, builds a foundation in the brain for all the learning, behavior, and health that follow. Okay, here's the other one, brain architecture. That's what I wanted to show. Okay. A child's experiences during the earliest years of life have a lasting impact on the architecture of the developing brain. Genes provide the basic blueprint, but experiences shape the process that determines whether a child's brain will provide a strong or weak foundation for all future learning, behavior, and health. During this important period of brain development, billions of brain cells called neurons send electrical signals to communicate with each other. These connections form circuits that become the basic foundation of brain architecture. Circuits and connections proliferate at a rapid pace and are reinforced through repeated use. Our experiences and environment dictate which circuits and connections get more use. Connections that are used more grow stronger and more permanent. Meanwhile, connections that are used less fade away through a normal process called pruning. 
Well-used circuits create lightning-fast pathways for neural signals to travel across regions of the brain. Simple circuits form first, providing a foundation for more complex circuits to build on later. Through this process, neurons form strong circuits and connections for emotions, motor skills, behavioral control, logic, language, and memory during the early critical period of development. With repeated use, these circuits become more efficient and connect to other areas of the brain more rapidly. While they originate in specific areas of the brain, the circuits are interconnected. You can't have one type of skill without the others to support it. Like building a house, everything is connected, and what comes first forms a foundation for all that comes later. Okay, so good. That's the, the two videos I wanted to show you. And I think it, if you notice anything, if you take away anything from the two, what is building those circuits is the serve and return the relationship. That's what we're talking about. And, you know, it's, it's, it's nothing. One thing I wanted to point out is serve and return is, um, what are we open, opening outlook now? <laughs> serve and return is, uh, it's, it's described as ordinary magic. It's nothing that difficult or scary or anything. It's just what, I mean, some parents do it naturally, and some parents who haven't had experience with babies need to learn a little bit about it. But it's, it's nothing, you know, it's nothing insurmountable, that's for sure.